Hello, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you all here. My name is Lisa Melandri. I'm the director here at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis. And I am thrilled to introduce Thelma Golden, director and chief curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem, as CAM's 2012 Susan Sherman Distinguished Speaker. The Susan Sherman Annual Distinguished Speaker Series is designed to bring scholarship and art commentary of the highest caliber to St. Louis. The program connects us with today's most relevant artists, curators, designers, and scholars. Since 2005, the Contemporary has hosted a wide variety of luminaries through its extraordinary program, and Thelma is a welcome and exciting addition to the list. And we, of course, thank Susan Sherman for the opportunity to be able to bring such luminaries here. Before... <laughs> Before assuming the position of director and chief curator at the Studio Museum, Thelma served as the deputy director for exhibitions and programs. And I had to enter this into the introduction. Just to give you kind of a taste, a little bit of a feel of the way that she has been a tastemaker and an influencer, I have to tell you that when I was offered a job at the Santa Monica Museum of Art, the director there at the time said, we're going to call you the deputy director for exhibitions and programs. And I said, oh, OK, okay that, that sounds good. And she said, because that's what Thelma is. So just <laughs> give you a sense. Throughout her career, she has organized a number of critically acclaimed exhibitions presenting the work of individual artists, Chris O'Feely, Glenn Ligon, Ramir Bearden, Gordon Parks, uh, Martin Purrier, Isaac Julian, and really extraordinary game-changing group exhibitions, two of which at the Studio Museum included Freestyle and Frequency. And in 2010, for what might be the best, or at least the coolest of all gigs, she was invited, appointed by President Obama to the Committee for the Preservation of the White House. Golden has promoted and encouraged many emerging artists in the field throughout her career, championing and shepherding their careers, not only through the exhibitions, but also at the Studio Museum through residency programs, which really sort of nurture their work over a lifetime. She's made an invaluable contribution to the field, consistently showing us a new way of looking things, at looking at things, which is something that we dearly appreciate in the art world. We are honored to have her here, Thelma. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Susan. It is such an honor to be here, to be a part of this distinguished lecture series, to be here in St. Louis, to be here to talk about art. It's been a crazy, complicated couple of weeks in New York City. And um, I have to say, leaving was hard because we've been um, in the city very kind of consumed in thinking about what has happened over these last weeks, but also a great pleasure in this moment to be able to step back and to talk about um, things that are important and that I love. It's also great to be in St. Louis again. Everyone keeps asking me if I've been here before, and I have. So I am thrilled. Thrilled to be here with, again, colleagues like Lisa, who I knew in her time at the Santa Monica Museum, and Dominic, who I knew from the MCA Chicago. Also thrilled to be in a room where I know Smith College is representing. They've already identified. Thank you. My Smith College sisters, always, no matter where I go in the world, I can always count on the fact that no matter what, there's going to be a Smithy in the room to cheer me on. So that is absolutely wonderful and fantastic. And great also um, because, you know, right now, the occasion for me to speak means that ultimately what I'm doing is thinking out loud because I've been a curator for and working in museums for 25 years and that's shocking to me. Um, I was so mortified the card they send out to tell you all tonight that picture, that picture's like 10 years old but I just decided today I'm just going to keep using it, right? <laughs> because clearly all of this is not the same but you know I, I looked at it I was like you know what that's a good thing but um, I for 25 years, I have been working in museums. And for most of that time, I have thought of myself as a curator. I have thought as a curator, I've spoken as a curator, I've lived in the world as a curator, someone deeply invested in making exhibitions, but also someone interested in defining that. 
Early in my career, about two years after I started working in museums, maybe my first year working at the Whitney Museum of American Art, where I worked for over a decade, I had the occasion to be introduced to uh, someone who is now a very famous, um, well-known African-American actor, but at the time he was unknown, um, and so was I. I was an aspiring curator, because I wasn't really a curator then, but wanted to be one. And the person who introduced us was an important, interesting, um, seminal writer. And when he introduced us, he introduced me as a curator. And this then unknown young African-American actor said, you know, what the heck is that? Now, that's not how he said it. He said it in a much more colorful way. And it really spurred me on to spend my career trying to figure that out. Like, what is that? What does it mean to be a curator? What does it mean to be invested in the presentation of artworks? But what has happened, this kind of significant shift for me, and the shift that I'm sitting in now and thinking about now, is really what it means to be a museum, right? We have this idea of what museums are, but we're in a moment where they need to be radically redefined. If they are going to live in the 21st century and live in the world that we all live in, what museums are has to be rethought. And if you are someone like me who's so deeply invested in the idea of change and the idea of evolution, then really museums have to be completely rebuilt. So I've had the amazing pleasure for the last 12 years of working at a fantastic institution, one that if it didn't exist, I might have had to invent it because it so wholly represents what I believe, and that is the Studio Museum in Harlem. And I also want to thank my colleagues here at the Contemporary Art Museum who let this logo sit up here for the last hour very generous um, of you all. And in thinking about that, I have to really start from kind of where I am. And one of the things that is so amazing to me about this institution that I now have the privilege to run, which I say to say that not to imagine that what I'm going to talk about is so specific to me, but I want you all to understand that in the thinking that I'm doing now really is about this idea of museums at large. But the name of the Studio Museum in many ways defines how I'm beginning to think about how museums can be, should be, and might change. So in 1968, when the Studio Museum was founded, it was very clear that in the name that it would be the Studio Museum in Harlem. Harlem, of course, standing out there because it is where we were. This is one of my favorite works of art ever. It's uh, Romeo Bearden's Uptown Looking Downtown. A uh, very literal title for me because it really in some ways describes my actual life most days, but also important because Romeo Bearden, pioneering African-American artist, fellowship named after him here in St. Louis at the St. Louis Museum of Art, but very important also to the founding of the Studio Museum because in 1968, when the Studio Museum was founded, it was with a radical idea that African-American artists were not adequately or appropriately invested in the history of American art. And the museum's primary focus at that moment was for radical canon revision, to insert this story of African-American artists. And Romeo Bearden was critical to that act. He took his own fame and his own sort of centrality at that moment and brought it to bear for the defining of the early studio museum. But this work, which he made, Bearden had a studio in Harlem for many years before he moved to Canal Street, also talks about the experience of living and being in that stretch of Upper Manhattan. At our founding in 1968, we of course were founded also in the sort of cauldron of energy that was the black arts movement. This is from Amiri Baraka's poem, Return of the Native. My favorite, really, description of Harlem, one then, but also that I think about now. Really, this idea of Harlem's beauty, so violent and transforming. It is out of this that, at that moment, this idea for a museum was founded. Our life began very modestly in a small, rented, second floor space on Fifth Avenue between 125th and 126th Street. It, we were created in a kind of multicultural group of supporters who believed that Harlem, as a community, needed a museum, deserved a museum, but also were interested in the role that artists could play in the dialogue of community reinvention. 
Our first space was a loft, so really bare and blank, not at all invested in the architecture of museums, not invested in the symbolism that that architecture meant, but really wanted to write a new sense of what museum space could and should be. And very literally was built from the ground up. Often people ask me, it's like a horrible question to ask someone. It's sort of like saying, who's your favorite child? But people always say, what's your favorite work in the Studio Museum collection? We have an amazing collection, over 2,400 works ranging from the 19th century to the present of artists of African descent. And it's hard for me any day to say what my favorite work is, but I have to say a work that I want to look at more than any other in our collection often is this painting by Jacob Lawrence uh, called The Architect. In our collection, almost since the beginning of the museum, but for me, so symbolic to the idea of what was at the initial founding of who we were, this idea of building something, creating something, defining something, designing it, and making it in the image that would reflect the community in real ways. Now, of course, what is so fantastic about you know, an institution that sort of builds itself anew is that when it's rooted in community, you inherit that legacy. And there is no legacy that's more interesting and amazing than the one in Harlem. These are all images taken in Harlem, actually from um, a volume that I edited a couple years ago called Harlem, A Century in Images, which was really meant to capture both the reality that photographers from all over the world have come to Harlem to take pictures, but also what this volume was meant to do was to create almost like a family photo album for the Harlem community so that we could see ourselves through the eyes of many different photographers. But through these photographs, what one sees is a community that's rich in its history, rich in defining its legacy, but also one where history defines so much of our day to day. This is an image from a um, United Negro Improvement Association protest. And protest, in many ways, also defines the political sphere of the community in which uh, my institution exists, so therefore is at the bedrock also of some of our institutional values. When people often ask me where we are, I say we are sort of equidistant between the Apollo Theater to our west and Bill Clinton's office to our east. <laughs> On your right is an image actually by an artist, Dave McKenzie, an artist who was in our residency program the year that Bill Clinton moved to Harlem. And of course, there was so much excitement about this, about Bill Clinton's offices, President Clinton coming up to Harlem, his offices being there. But of course, a year later, all the reporters kept coming asking, you know, have you seen President Clinton? And so Dave McKenzie decided to take this on, and he bought this mask, and he would spend his entire residency just walking the streets of Harlem in his Bill Clinton mask, and a fantastic and amazing, amazing piece came out of that. This is the rich context in which I think. So, you know, as a curator, I thought lots and lots about artwork. But now I really think about this idea of place as a way to define how and who we are. And in place and in placemaking, this idea of being in a place or of a place is sort of critical. And I've defined that as it relates to my own sense of place, as for the Studio Museum, as something that I've called the prepositional problematic. And that is because our name is the Studio Museum in Harlem. And at least 400 times a day, someone calls us the Studio Museum of Harlem. Now, this is one of these complicated things, like if you have a name perhaps that might be complicated to pronounce and you sort of have to decide if you're going to correct people when they say it incorrectly or let it stand, it means that you're always thinking about what those differences mean. But in a very profound way for me, this problematic has really defined the space in which I've tried to understand what it means to be institutionally relevant, to be in a community or of a community, in a community and of a community, how those two things play together. The Studio Museum in Harlem, of course, speaks about our place, and all museums are some place. But the Studio Museum of Harlem, that, that common mistake, I've actually embraced as also being a way in which we understand how relevance can be defined through program, through collection, through the way in which we speak institutionally. 
And it is from that place that I've taken um, a, a model that in curating is quite common and applied it to how I now think about the hard work of institution building. So in contemporary art, we often talk about site specificity, artists that come and sort of define their work based on the terms that they encounter in a place. But I'm really questioning this idea of how museums, how institutions can be site specific, and perhaps also how they can be site sensitive, and how they should be site significant, and how in the work that they do, they should be highly, highly, highly site suggestive. So in thinking through that matrix, it really, for me, has defined a new way to understand a museum life. There's a fantastic line in the seminal play by Entezaki Shange um, called For Colored Girls Who've Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough, where one of the characters says, I used to live in the world, and now I live in Harlem, and my universe is six blocks. And that really could define my life and the space in which I live right now. I'm showing you a map right here, which basically shows Manhattan. And this is an incredible map to look at because there's another way I could show you this map right now, which could talk about the world we're living in post the hurricane, um, with that sort of red and gray and white really representing other things. But specifically, I want to train your eye on that little circle, which sort of defines the space in upper Manhattan. You know, to talk about an institution means one has to engage in community. And there are lots of terms we use in the museum world to understand this. We talk about ideas about uh, how we engage audience, how we engage community. But at the Studio Museum, something else I've been involved in is that we, as an institution, have to be engaged in definitions of community. And in Harlem in particular, one of the most profound shifts and the profound changes has been that what has been defined through the space of gentrification. As a curator, of course, the way in which I understand things, of course, is to ask artists, to ask artists to ask the questions and maybe even come to the answers for those issues which seem profound and need to be discussed. And in 2004, when constantly being asked about what gentrification means, what it means to be an art museum in the midst of a community that's evolving and changing, I couldn't ever answer the question in a way that felt adequate, that felt interesting, that felt inspired. And so made an exhibition at that time called Harlem World, where I commissioned 18 uh, architects of African descent, emerging architects, and asked them as architects to think about Harlem in its past, its present, and its future. And the reason that was sort of the premise is that I found a very interesting phenomenon. I think this happens for many communities in flux. And that is that in the present moment, people always talk about them as they were or as they will be. Right? So everyone was always talking about Harlem as it was, or what Harlem would be. So this exhibition, for me, was a way to frame with artists and architects how to imagine a present defined in other ways. So in this exhibition, one of the architects came up with a project which, for me, still stands as a way to understand the complexity, but also the hilarity of trying to understand gentrification and what it could mean for an institution. And this is a project by Ron Norsworthy. And what he designed um, was a condominium tower, which he called Reparation Tower. <laughs> Reparation Tower, as you can see, is designed with certain architectural modernist standards in, of course, the uh, image of a clenched fist. This is the corner of 7th Avenue and 125th Street, corner made famous, the corner where Malcolm X spoke, et cetera. Net, what's on it now is a state office building that is raised for this glass and steel tower. Ron designed this schematic drawing, but then with, the, with most of his commission money, he bought um, a classified ad in the New York Times real estate section. And in that ad, he advertised for luxury condominiums in upper, on the upper, upper, upper west side. <laughs> he described them as having all of the features one would imagine in a luxury apartment. Bamboo floors, Viking range, sub-zero refrigerator, so on and so forth. But he also 
uh, describe them as having the qualities that would absolve anyone from any kind of um, discomfort they might feel in being an early gentrifier. Right? So that by living in this reparation tower, it would automatically indicate that you believed in the ideals of equality. You were a part of the struggle as opposed to an interloper. The building itself, the lobby, would exist as a space in which community action would happen alongside with concierge service. Um, <laughs> right? And he described and, and really put together truly all of the both realities and anxieties in this space. In the space of the exhibition, in the museum, he used his small space in the exhibition to create what's equivalent to those kind of model apartments that they create for condominiums. And on, in the ad in the New York Times, he put a phone number that you could call if you want to make an appointment for the open house, which was the museum's number. But then he also put a time for the open house, which was our opening. Now, when he came up with this conceit, I thought, OK, nobody, 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 nobody is going to believe this is actually real. And if they come to the opening, they're coming to the opening. They're not coming to buy you know, these apartments. But I have to tell you, it was amazing that actually people came imagining that this was a real possibility. And it was with this project and others that have followed that I've continued to explore this idea of how artists can, in many ways, drive these conversations into places that really open up their big, the big spaces which still need to be explored. Also, though, coming to the present, you know, it's hard for me not to talk about sort of Harlem right now. And, you know, even in the context of the work that I do with my board, you know, the Studio Museum is a small institution. We've been around almost 50 years. We have a committed and amazing board. We talk about all of those things that one talks about in an institution, but constantly have to talk about the place that we're in. And it's often hard for me to describe these complexities. And we had a meeting in January, and I was in the um, new, very sort of she-she, but community-sensitive uh, supermarket that just opened up in Harlem. Harlem. And on the one hand, it sells things like Jiffy Cornbread. I don't know if that's a St. Louis thing. Does anyone know? See? Right. Okay, you all know, right? Jiffy Cornbread mix. But it also organic, you know, sort of artisanal yogurt, all in the same store. So trying to be very much in this community as it is. But I got to the cash register one day, and there was this sign. And saying, EBT cards cannot be used to purchase sushi. Now, again, I don't know if that translates here, but in New York, EBT is our electronic benefits program, what used to be known as food stamps. And the sign is basically saying that you cannot use food stamps to buy sushi. Now, what that really means, I have to break this down, I'm going to get very deep here. What everyone knows is one can't use food stamps for prepared food. That's a long time rule. And what's interesting, however, about this sign is for me, again, it brought up just I stood there and looked at it because I thought, OK, is this just adding sushi to the prepared food list? Or um, were there many people with EBT cards wanting to buy sushi? <laughs> or it, like there's no way to answer this that doesn't open up, right, in, in very real ways. The inability to live within silos of thinking we can understand the complexity of what it means to be existing in a sort of changing, diverse, evolving place. Now, what this means is that this is all, OK, what is in my head as I step into uh, working in a museum, being a museum director as a curator every day. I should also say, you know, the other day I um, acknowledged that, you know, one of the reasons why um, I, there's this new word, you know, how every year they put new words in the dictionary. So there's this new word called earworm, and that means something that, like, you hear over and over again such that you can't get it out of your head. And my office faces 125th Street, literally. And and I'm on, our building is a former bank. It was a bank that was built in 1906 when 125th Street was the main street of this upper Manhattan suburban community. So Harlem was farmland, then was developed. It became a suburb of Manhattan. And 125th Street was developed to be the main street. The building we're in was a bank, very esteemed bank, but went out of business in the 60s, as most businesses did. So my 
office is literally facing the street and below me, like so close, as close as Lisa is now, is a man who is um, a vendor, street vendor, and he sells all kinds of things. Right now he's selling a lot of Obama 2012 mem memorabilia, but his products change. He also sells bootleg CDs. And so, and he plays them over and over and over again. And so I have an earworm, and my earworm is Al Green, Love and Happiness, because he plays this on a constant loop and has for about five years. And so that everything I think and know and think even about art comes with that as my soundtrack, which is actually a transformative thing, I have to say, transformative. So imagine Love and Happiness and Museum. So when the Studio Museum was founded, it was with the idea that museum was sort of a radical gesture, right? It indicated a kind of power, power in the art world, power in the cultural world, power around defining what art is and who has the power to say what it would be. So when our founders put the word museum in our title, it was with the idea and the aspiration of what the kind of work that an institution that was defining itself to create a space for artists who had not been given that space could and should be. So in the space that exists now, we are constantly trying to define what museums are. And in the simplest way, we could say that the sort of dichotomy is, are museums a place for art with people? A place devoted to the presentation of artworks? A place devoted to the presentation of making exhibitions? Is that truly, at core, what a museum mission is? Or are museums a place for people? with art. Dynamic institutions defined to create for people the experience of conversation and dialogue in the space of art. I am constantly moving between these things. I go back and forth. Could not for you say that one or the other is the way in which we should and can understand what we are. But again, just like the sort of in and of institutions for me in the 21st century, institutions bounded and grounded in an idea of their relationship to their place and their community, institutions invested in their mission should be and can be both. I think when we think about that, However, we are understanding, though, that this space in which we think about how museums operate for most of the public have to change. One of the most interesting things for me is this idea of accessibility, right? How people come to places like this, how you all came here tonight, how you all understand what a museum can offer in the conversation. But also, perhaps as important for me, is this idea of the development of audience. Um, this image is one of my favorites taken in the museum because clearly some of what we do at the Studio Museum in developing audiences is by developing those audiences really early. We have the great privilege of being so rooted in the community that for many of our young visitors, we are their first experience with the museum. And then sometimes we define for them what a museum is, their experience with us. But in a larger way, I'm very interested in the complexity of this idea of who museum audiences are and who they will be. Now I had the amazing privilege of growing up in New York City. I grew up in Queens, in Southeast Queens, and the great, great, great struggle of my adolescence with my parents was being able to ride the subway alone. Right? That was the thing I was waiting for. And I know in other places it's about driving, but as a New York City kid, driving is not something you imagine you will ever do. The real key is when you get to take the subway by yourself. Now I have to say, because I'm dating myself, because now in the sort of new New York, that's not really a big deal because we're a safe New York, we're a clean New York, but you know, I you know, grew up in New York in the 70s and the 80s, so taking the subway by yourself was truly an act of great bravery, right? And no same parent was going to go along with that just you know, for the sake of it. So that this was my fight, and the reason I wanted to do that is because to t be able to take the subway from Queens by myself meant that I could go to museums. And it meant that I could visit museums. And at that point in my life, museums were already really, really, really important to me. So when my mother finally conceded 
to allowing me to take the subway by myself. It actually defined where I went because the subway I was allowed to take was the one that went from our house. I wasn't allowed to change trains, to stay on the same train, which meant that I could only really go to the Museum of Modern Art. But how bad was that, right? That that, thank goodness, was the museum at the end of the F train that I could take. And in many ways, that idea of how I felt and really grew up feeling that that museum was mine is some of what I try and now I'm thinking about how museums can embed in what they are. I had an interesting experience, though, on this uh, idea of audience in my own institution a few years ago. And we all speak to this idea of how we want to understand our audiences. So I spent a lot of time in our gallery space. And I was down in the gallery, and there was a family, a young family, a mother and a father and two children, about eight and 10 years old, African American. And they were looking at an exhibition. We had an exhibition up at the time, a group exhibition. They were really, I could tell that the mom was sort of talking to the kids about the work and the father was reading the wall labels. And it was you know, one of those scenes that I wish we had our photographer. I was going to take pictures to put in our annual report. And I walked up to them, and I thanked them for coming. And I was so thrilled. And I sort of jumped into a bunch of assignments. So I thanked them for coming, I asked them how often they came, and then I asked them where they lived because I made a direct assumption that they were neighbors, that they lived in Harlem. And they said, oh, we've just driven in, we live in Greenwich, Connecticut, that is. Okay. A year later, in the galleries again, having my same excitement at seeing people engage, and I see these two young Japanese kids, young guy has on a pair of sneakers that like only two pairs were made and you would have had to sleep on the street for four days to get them to be first. The young woman has sort of like dreadlocks that are kind of made out of that molding mud and then she's got them up on her head and a margella. I mean, just fantastic. Like the whole look, everything about it. They've got their iPhones and even though we don't allow photography in the gallery, I'm letting them take pictures, you know, because I'm just thinking they're just so cool. So I go up to them and I say, welcome to Harlem, you know, so glad you're here. And, you know, and I go on and I ask where else they're going to visit because, of course, you know, we are, as I say, half block from the Apollo, down the street from the Lennox Lounge. Sylvia is the Red Rooster. So I'm getting ready to do my Harlem tour guide thing. And, um, and I say, where else are you visiting? And they say, oh, we live at 119th and Lennox, literally around the corner. Right? So again, you can't buy sushi with the EBT card. Live around the corner, live in Greenwich. All of those things, all of those are definitive for me in understanding the spaces that we create in museums to really be a part and understand these kinds of changes. Also, though, important to this and this idea of a place for art with, for people and a place for people with art is this idea of, though, being invested in history. Because, you know, as a community changes, there really does need to be a constant that sort of looks backwards. And there does need to be a place that can inform and define what has come before. So that living in a place that has such deep history, there is a space that even in a contemporary art museum, you can open up this kind of revisionist idea of what has happened in the past. So with those young Japanese people who knew more about the Harlem Renaissance than I'm going to venture than some high school students in America might know, right? Because they had obsessively sort of wanted to understand the place they were in, gave me the sense of also how we needed to relay that kind of specific information to the people who live right across the street from us and don't have it as part of their day to day. Now, in some ways, some days I get up and I just think, like, who have I become? You know, a person who spent all their time thinking about art, and now I'm out taking pictures of, you know, signs in the grocery store, right? And, and, and walking up and down the streets. But I have to say, in many ways, the skills that allow us as curators to be able to see art and make meaning in exhibitions is also, in many ways, how I think as an institution maker, as an institution builder now, I can make meaning um, with art in an institutional context. But perhaps the most profoundly radical gesture 
that was created by our founders and what I feel is the most profound gift that has been given to me at the Studio Museum is the idea that in our founding this idea of the studio. Now many people ask, you know, because it's kind of a strange idea, right? Why are we the Studio Museum in Harlem? And it is because in our founding moment there was this desire to capitalize on the reality that as a cultural community, particularly a cultural community attached to African American culture, Harlem, as the home of the Harlem Renaissance, is without precedent. Right? Black art was made, literally, on the streets and in the lofts and in the apartments of the Harlem community. And in 1968, when we were founded, this was a distant memory because we were a community that was suffering from economic deprivation, educational inequality, uh, real and true um, issues that affected the community in a real way so that the art and culture was not at the forefront. So the idea of creating a museum that was invested in artist practice was important to think about the future, but it was really also a way to honor the past. So the studio in our name comes from the fact that from the very moment we were founded, we have had the privilege of having three artists every year working in the museum, making their work, using Harlem as their base, their inspiration, their instigation, and at the end of that year, we've had the opportunity as an institution to present their work. Now, in the beginning of this program, it was quite an informal structure. The studio space was in the back. The museum was in the front. It was a very porous. There wasn't really a wall between the two. So that the public had the opportunity to actually go into the studio and engage with the artists who were working. The artists who were working had the opportunity to hang their work on the walls of the museum. And this idea of both the process and the production were actually very close together. Also at that time, it was important that in the studio program that people had the audience, had the opportunity to understand these artists as members of the community, as working in the space of the museum, working in Harlem, but also having a dialogue um, with them around. This is just a selection. I mean, over these years, there are over 100 artists in this program. Selection started from the top, Kehinde Wiley, Allison Saar, Julie Moretu, Carrie James Marshall, Clifford Owens, David Hammonds, McLean Thomas. Small selection, but really a selection that shows the diversity of kind of artistic voices that have spent time. I have the great privilege of now, the artist studios are above my office, so okay, so remember Remember, I have love and happiness, happiness, right, on continuous loop all day coming from the window. But above me, I have this kind of crash bang that happens hourly. And it's kind of amazing because if I did not remember why I'm doing what I do, it's when that crash bang happens above me in the studio that I remember um, what we are as an institution, why we are. Right? So we know what we are, we're a museum, where we are, we're in Harlem, but why are we there? And it is for artists. It also, in having artists in the institution physically, it changes the dynamic of how one thinks about artworks because they aren't disinvested from their makers. Their makers are right there with us. It's a program where, in that space, our buildings open 24 hours, so the artists can work there all the time. They kind of define their own schedule, and they often do. You know, I often say to people, I have to go back to Kehinde Wiley. I just had the occasion of, you know, again, having, you know, the crazy thing about middle age is like you're constantly in this moment of like all these ahas about your life. But Kehinde recently, there's an amazing volume that's been done about his work um, by Rizzoli. And uh, when they asked me, to write for it, he reminded me that he had told me this before, but that in 1995, uh, 1994, I made an exhibition at the Whitney Museum called Black Male Representations of Masculinity in Contemporary American Art. And it went to Los Angeles in 1995. Kehinde Wiley was in high school in 1995, and he asked his mother to take him to see the exhibition. 
In 2004, he graduated from Yale and came to the Studio Museum. And in that year that he was at the Studio Museum, he told me that story, right? So he lined up for me where our paths had crossed before and where they were ending up together again at the Studio Museum. And in having the occasion to write about his work, in thinking about that sort of circularness, it reminded me that Kehinde, like so many artists in the program, when he came into the program, literally it was the sort of inflection point in his career because many of you know his work is sort of defined by a kind of portrait style in which he makes images, works, paintings of young African-American men. Well, that work began when he was in our studio program, spending time walking up and down 125th Street and one day encountering, um, which it was still common as it is now, to encounter posted up on 125th Street FBI wanted posters. And he was amazed at the kind of photographic representation that those wanted posters included, the sort of mugshot, compared with the kind of European portraiture that was informing and inspiring his interest. And those two things for him collided, and he began in that year to invite his peers to come up to his studio, studio above my office, to look with him at these great volumes of art historical works of European painting and began his process of painting those young men into the history of art through his portrait style. And it is that space, that physical space, but also the intellectual space of the studio, the studio in our name, that is so important, really the heart of our mission. It also is defined, though, by an artist like David Hammonds here in the corner, who in his studio time spent the time not physically in the studio, but in the space of Harlem. And in the works that he made, right, really definitive works of his, that existed out in public space, that all came from materials that he found on the streets of Harlem at that time. Empty wine bottles, bottle caps, hair, black hair from barbershops, the discards at the end of the barbershop day. Materials that now cannot be found, right, in the New Harlem. So now exist again as another kind of historic reminder of our recent past. The studio program also, though, has housed artists who've come just for the moment, but then gone back to where they might be. Carrie James Marshall on your right, who spent the year in Harlem making his work, but went back to Chicago and remains a pillar, a real root there for artists and making the work that for him has always been defined again about another way of engaging with uh, community. So the studio really, in our name, is not our name. It is what we are. And it really, again, speaks to what museums can be when we think about artists in a different way than just being about the space of presentation. This is actually, you know, it's funny, I often have to look at my sides and I realize when I look at this image again of Kehinde that is very much at the moment he began making those paintings. That was in the first month of his residency program in 2004. Now, of course, I have to pause because, um, as I say, worlds collide. And so one of the amazing things about being an institution that nurtures artists is that that nurturing is something that does not end simply with the end of an exhibition or the end of a residency year. We remain thrilled and proud to see their work out in the world. So nothing makes me more proud than to see the work of Leslie Hewitt, former studio museum artist and resident, and to see her work here in the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis. Leslie, like so many other artists who've come in our program, we had the privilege to watch and see her define the vocabulary and the space in which she wanted to work. But now, I'm thrilled to see the growth, the absolute beautiful trajectory that is in this amazing and beautiful presentation of her work that I got to see here today. So I, we are thrilled to have this happen here and really thank you all for continuing with what feels like, you know, our mission. You know, another space in which that I think museums often have to understand is that we exist in almost like a familial lineage. And so in many ways, the artists that begin with us, we see their work as existing to extend the way in which our mission can live in the world um, onward. And Leslie's work has done that. But also, in this thinking about institutional work, there are ways in which the space of exhibitions can also define um, 
how institutional space can be made new and different for the context in which it's existing uh, today. Last year, as I said, Romer Bearden was a significant important artist in the founding of the Studio Museum. And in thinking about how to engage a current generation of artists with the past, always the challenge there is to make that mean something more than just what can be the sort of static engagement with fixed histories. So on the occasion of the Bearden Centennial, in an idea that began as a very small one but then grew through the impetus of artists, to celebrate Romere Bearden and to celebrate him in his centennial year, we initiated a project asking artists to make a work inspired by Romere Bearden. And we started out with 25 artists with the goal to get to 100 over the centennial year, which I'm pleased to say we did. And uh, in that, over the course of a year, had a hundred different artists ranging from Sanford Biggers to Derek Adams, Carrie James Marshall, uh, Leonardo Drew, Romier, uh, all in conversation with Romier Bearden <coughs> over the course of that year. It was an amazing and fantastic project, one that began with no bounds whatsoever, right? So that we sent, I, I wrote every artist, sort of asking them if they could reconcile their sense of how to honor an artist who we all owe so much to. And for me personally, that was really what began the project. How could the Studio Museum not honor this great artist in his centennial year? But then to say to artists, okay, but with that in mind, knowing that this is an artist of great innovation, what would you do to honor him? Sent everyone four pieces of paper, all of the same size. I sent them a selection of Bearden works, which I felt would instigate this idea that Bearden is a much more complex artist than he's often understood out in the world. And then also sent them some of his own words, right? Bearden was a prolific writer. He wrote about himself as well as he wrote about other artists and ask them then with no other brief other than that to then send back what they might imagine could be a work that happened in that year. What was most amazing and profound about this project is that on the bottom next to the rooster um, is uh, a work by John Outerbridge. The rooster's by Mark Andre Robinson. On top is um, Brenna Youngblood. And there, in this project of the 100 artists, about 50 of them, at their own initiation, not ours, had decided to give them to the collection of the Studio Museum. So, and to begin what would be the Bearden Bicentennial Project, so that they will live in our collection, so that at the point well beyond any of us that we celebrate this artist again, they will be there as a base. But moving to the present, that was an exhibition last year, which really, again, expresses this idea of a studio, but also expresses a kind of dynamic curatorial practice that's responsive and reactive to site and environment and history. But right now, we just opened, um, delayed a little bit by Hurricane Sandy, another centennial celebration. And that is of the photographer Gordon Parks. Now, as I said about Five years ago, I became obsessed with the way in which, you know, Harlem looms so large in the imagination. You know, I am a child of, you know, a very complicated marriage, and that is that my father was born and raised in Harlem, and my mother was born and raised in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Now, if there are any New Yorkers here, you know, that's just like, you know, there's, 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 that's, that's a non-negotiation point, right? I mean, there's no give on either side there. Those are, you know, and both of my mother was, my father was born in 1926, my mother, 1930, so they <coughs> lived in those communities in their real heyday. And so when my parents got married in 1963, the Great Compromise, which is truly the thing that I have tried to, you know, um, get over for my entire life, is that they moved to Queens. <laughs> that's how that got resolved. And, um, but in that resolution, in my family, my parents both tried to engage my brother, who's a year younger than I, in 
wanting us to claim um, their ancestral home. And it wouldn't surprise you, of course, that my father won, right, on the Harlem side, because in some ways, it's actually, um, as, as funny as it is, it's very profound to me that I literally live, my apartment is across the street from the hospital where my father was born in 1926. The studio museum is three doors down from the first office where he began his business as a lawyer and insurance broker. I eat lunch physically every day in a restaurant that has been in that place through the life of my father and that we now, he at 87, and I have conversations about places that exist for me now that existed for him as a young person, right? So like we're just living the same life. Now this did not throw my mother, she's now sadly deceased, but before she was, this did not thrill her at all, right? My uh, sort of Harlem obsession. But I also um, have the occasion of having this kind of memory that's not my own, right? I have a memory of a, a place that existed well before I was alive because I, I get the chance to live it through my father's eyes. And one of the ways in which as a curator, of course, I've reconciled that is through this obsession with um, the photographs of Harlem, which is what led to the book that I described but continues to lead me to um, sort of photojournalism in many cases, something well outside of my own curatorial expertise. And when I first got to the Studio Museum in 2000, I had the opportunity to spend some time with the amazing Gordon Parks, um, who was still alive. And the Studio Museum did not have a Gordon Parks work in the collection. And with my acquisition committee, I made one of those kind of horrific list, a wish list of all the works that I hope to have. It's a list that I'm still checking off 12 years later, right? All the things. So, you know, I, and I often in public put things out there. So Palmer Hayden, anyone, you know, want <laughs> on the wish list. But on my wish list was a Gordon Parks photograph. And when I said that to Mr. Parks, he said, we can make that happen. And any one who ever had the occasion, or I send anyone to the documentary about him, Half Past Autumn, the most suave, debonair, fantastic man ever. So he said, Miss Golden, of course, we can make that happen. And in that conversation, I got the opportunity to look at some of the work that was in his archive that's now become the estate. And in that conversation, he spoke to me at length about spending a year in Harlem in 1967 with a family called the Fontanelles. And he had been assigned by Life Magazine, where he worked as the first African-American photojournalist for Time Life. And Life was doing a whole magazine, an issue, devoted to poverty in America. And they asked Parks to do a story that would exemplify poverty. And he chose, rather than doing a wide photo essay in many different cities, to spend a year with this family, the Fontanelles. And the Fontanelles lived in abject poverty in Harlem. It's a mother, father, and their five children. Um, they lived in what still now is called a tenement um, building. They lived through what was a winter of no heat, a spring of all sorts of job and health crises. And Parks lived with them and documented their life. When the story was published in 1968 in Life, it caused a sensation. People from around the country sent checks and money in care of Mr. Parks for this family, and he was able with that money to buy them a house in Long Island. And what he always said is he hoped that that story would have a happy ending, but it did not. Right? The family did move to Long Island, but unfortunately, some years later, the house burned down, just a freak accident, burnt to the ground, no insurance. Some of the older children in this family, while thrilled to move to Long Island, were drawn back to Harlem and fell into both drugs and crime and died. And the family never really were able to get beyond the profound effects, not just the circumstance of poverty, but really the legacy of poverty. And for Parks, that remained a lesson. And he used the story as a way to talk about how he felt his camera could be a weapon, as, a, as his camera could aid him in his own fight for justice. So when having the opportunity to think about a work to enter into our collection, I felt that we had to acquire work out of this series of the Fontenelle family, which I did in 2001. And then right after that, his memoir, Gordon Parks' memoir, was republished. And the publisher asked us if we might um, hold a book party for him at the museum. 
which we were thrilled to do. And then it ended up being his last public appearance right before his passing. So I felt that that photograph for me was incredibly, incredibly special. So upon thinking about, again, the Gordon Park Centennial, it made sense for us to revisit the Fontenelle family. So right now, just open, we have all of the photographs from that original life story in 1967, plus many images that were never printed, that I had the occasion on that first visit and then again to see in the archive that we've printed, which not only bring us back to a profound moment in American history, that is the sort of Harlem of the late 60s, but also are really an indictment of really how these conditions still exist in the community I live in today. There are still children living in deep poverty in Harlem. There are still families without. We live in Harlem down the street from an amazing, amazing man, Jeffrey Canada, who runs something called the Harlem Children's Zone. And it is really in inspiration and in honor of his work, again, that I also put this exhibition up because it really shows the way in which um, understanding how, on the one hand, yes, communities evolve and they change and they gentrify, but also we must remain mindful of the profound circumstance that many people continue to live in. And the story of the Fontenelles is a, a story that needs to continue to be told. But that all, this also, for me, was an exhibition which goes to the heart of our mission because it really shows the power of an artist to be in the space of their world and how they can show us things that we would not normally see, even things we have lived. When I showed my father these images, this is something that was familiar to him. I mean, he knew these spaces. He knew apartments like this. But on the other hand, he was profoundly moved by them. And then seeing them now up just for a few days with us and watching both the young people as well as some of the elders in our community and even tourists coming in, understanding the way in which, again, parks, like so many artists, like all great artists, like all significant artists, allow us to see our world in different and important and profound ways. And that, for me, is what makes working with artists and creating the space for the presentation of art so significant and so important. It's another set of these images. Really, really amazing. The Fontenelle grandchildren are still alive and we're having um, a program at the museum in the winter where we are going to be thrilled to have them think about and talk about um, these images as their own family's legacy. And then finally, we um, also, I as a curator, I'm thrilled, you know, again, to, to come back to the thing that really is for me what brings me to you all today, and that is I am a curator who loves art and artists, a curator who has never not learned things from the experience of being in the space with art and being in a space with artists thinking about their work. And when I got to the Studio Museum in 2000, it was after a decade of working at the Whitney Museum, which I loved, a decade of working in a museum devoted to American art, which I felt deeply about, um, a decade after working with a generation of artists who, by the time I left the Whitney Museum, were deeply and profoundly at mid-career. And so when I got to the Studio Museum in what might be considered a sort of curatorial midlife crisis, I decided that I sort of wanted to start all over again and begin to look at emerging artists and new work and try and define it. So there, you know, in the glow of sort of the new millennium, I thought I'll make an exhibition of emerging artists, which um, was called Freestyle. Now at that time, I sort of created terms around this exhibition because I also was interested, because I was sitting within the legacy of 40 years of profound art making by black artists that had come out of the black arts movement. Again, after the Harlem Renaissance, the sort of the next signpost, which really defines who I am, but wanted to understand what a generation of artists who were several generations away from that moment were thinking about as it related to identity and race and culture in art.
So Freestyle took this on, 28 emerging artists from all over the country, an exhibition made literally a year into my new role um, in this institution. At the time that um, I made this exhibition, people kept saying, are you going to do it again? And I said, no, about 100 times. Like, of course not. We're not going to do it again. And then, lo and behold, four years later, frequency. Now, that, because freestyle was freestyle, then frequency became frequency. This, this exhibition series has now become known as the F series, because after frequency in 2004, followed by flow in 2008. Now, freestyle and frequency focused on um, artists of African descent working in the US, national exhibition, artists all over the country, again, defining the space of kind of identity and race in contemporary art. Flow took a little bit of a step out in that Flow examined artists of African descent living and working on the continent of Africa or outside of it, but not the US. It was looking to define the sort of peer group cohort for this group of artists of African descent who were working around the world. We were interested in the way in which in a kind of cosmopolitan sort of global world, the um, sort of global African presence was sort of making itself known uh, all over and the way in which that this exhibition could begin to define it in terms that looked at it through a contemporary art lens but also a kind of global geopolitical lens as well. Look at it through issues of exile and movement and migration. Now, of course, three times I said we weren't going to do it again, right? So freestyle, I said, no, we're not doing it again. Then we did frequency, no, we're not doing it again. We did flow, not doing it again. So here we are today, the fourth of these F shows, which just opened, call four, F-O-R-E, but of course, the fourth in this sort of iteration of the F shows itself. So again, what makes these exhibitions possible is exactly what made the Studio Museum possible in 1968 and necessary, and that is the incredible breadth and energy of artists of African descent making work that explores and examines art and art making, concept and idea, identity and politics in the world today. This exhibition has 29 artists, again, from all over the country, working across media. Some names that I'm going to venture that maybe nobody knows, a few that people have discovered already, but I guarantee you, as has been the case and has been to our great um, uh, thrill, they are artists who you will continue to hear from and hear about in years to come. Another group of works from this exhibition. One of, you know, there are so many effects of this hurricane, many profound and important, um, but one that's very minor in relation to the rest of the world. But th this exhibition has a catalog, um, but it has been somehow lost in the FedEx system for the last couple of weeks. <laughs> so I just heard that it's in New York, and hopefully it will be getting to us um, any moment now. So we're very excited to have that happen. So I began with Bearden's Uptown Looking Downtown, a work created at the moment the museum was founded, one that defines in so many ways, as I said, this idea of an institution rooted very much in its community, rooted where it is, but already then thinking about itself out in the world, imagining the effect it could have to define a space for black artists in the world. And I end with a work by Julie Moretu, defined by her looking at a kind of world exploded, imploded, one in which its fragments become a whole, one that really speaks to, again, the life that I am privileged to live now in this institution, which imagines ourselves at this point in our history. Again, very rooted, but thinking about artists of African descent, thinking about their role and their voice, honoring it, preserving it, and presenting it now and in the future all around the world. Thank you. if I was allowed to take questions because you know I know some places you're not allowed to talk but hopefully we can if there are any I would love questions comments oh my gosh yes
You mean because they're not artists of African descent? Yeah. Um, yes and no. You know, the thing about museum missions is that they're fixed, but they're organic. And, you know, one of the things, there's so many different stories at the Studio Museum. There's a whole story of my career that's about women in the museum field. As I said, you know, I went to Smith College, so I'm going to ask the Smiths, we're going to clap again, right? Just, okay. And, you know, that defined my curatorial life because Dorothy Miller, who was really the first professional curator at the Museum of Modern Art, hired there in 1930, right after they were founded, is a, was a Smith alum. And as a Smith student, I learned about Dorothy Miller's work at the Museum of Modern Art. She curated a group of seminal exhibitions that were all called the Americans. They had numbers, 14 Americans, 16 Americans. But they really introduced a whole generation of artists that now are the bedrock of mid-century American art. Rothko, Pollock, Lichtenstein, pioneering, amazing curator. Also, this, my studio museum life is also defined by some pioneering women, and very specifically, <coughs> Mary Schmidt Campbell, who became director of the studio museum in 77, just a few years after we were founded, but really is the one who defined the space right, that I work in now. She physically created the building we are in. She got that building, got us into it, but also defined many of the things that I'm talking to you about. So I say that to say that uh, Mary Campbell told me um, that our mission is artists of African descent, but that she got a call in um, the middle 80s, and it was from Louise Nevelson, who called her because there was an article in the newspaper about Martin Luther King, and it was around the time that the King holiday came, and she was very moved by this article and moved by the national holiday, and on the day that King was assassinated, Louise had made one of her combine pieces, black combine piece, but she never sent it to the gallery, she never showed it. She made it in honor of Martin Luther King and put it away. And she called up the Mary Campbell the Studio Museum and she says, I wanna give this work to the Studio Museum. And you can imagine what the Studio Museum said. We said, thank you very much. It stands as a major work in our collection. So, but it made sense, right? So are there artists? I mean, sure. I got to the Studio Museum, as I say, having worked at the Whitney. And for my first month or two, you know, I was new. I don't know if Lisa had experience, but I didn't know what to do for the first month or two. I mean, I didn't really, you know, I didn't have shows yet. So I was just hanging out. And artists were all coming to see me all of my artist friends. And at that time, as now, everyone had a camera phone. And inevitably, they were all getting off the subway either at the A train to our west or the 2-3 train to our east. And between the subway and the museum, they would all take 100 pictures, because that is how great 125th Street is, right? Um, Glenn Ligon once said to me that when he walks down 125th Street, it makes him think he should stop making artwork, because it's all been done. It's all out there. <laughs> So they all came with these pictures. So I had this idea. I thought, OK, everybody's taking pictures. And as I say, I'm obsessed with this idea of this vision of Harlem. So I started a project called Harlem Postcards, where artists come, they take a picture, any picture, even with a camera phone. We print it as a postcard. And then we give them out for free in the museum. So when tourists come or visitors come. So there are ways in which I think that even within the bedrock of our mission, which is to present and preserve and interpret the work of artists of African descent, we still, I can embrace and engage artists of all sorts. Um, when our mission was written to say artists of African descent, as opposed to African American artists, William Kentridge said to me, right? William Kentridge, the white South African artist, said to me, fantastic. Fantastic. And that, even for me, and I, he was right. He's an artist of African descent. It, it you know, the, the fluidity by which we can curatorially understand these things is what makes it richer. So no, there hasn't been an occasion um, when I felt like, because our mission has stopped us, it's just a question of the context. Yes. I also really enjoyed your talk, and I was really moved by the way you talked about the both being shaped by the place of Harlem and also shaping Harlem itself. And so the sort of movement in both directions. And I'm wondering, are there other museums around the country or around the world that you think have a similar relationship with a particular place that has been important for you in thinking about the mission of your Sure. I mean, I think all institutions have a relationship to place. It's just a question of how you define it. It's like all relationships, right? You know? Um, so some can be with some distance. That's necessary. Some can be with lack of distance. 
you know, um, some, you know, can move based on, you know, different needs and, and times. I mean, I have to say, um, you know, I worked for 10 years at the Whitney Museum on Madison Avenue and 75th Street, and it's true. I never walked into the Whitney or walked out every day thinking, I really have to think about Madison Avenue. I didn't. I mean, it just never occurred to me. Um, where, as I think about 125th Street, like, every single day. And like I say, the vendor guy, I mean, I open my window, we talk literally out the window um, all the time about all kinds of things, right? Um, and so, and I, so I do feel like there are lots of different institutions that inform aspects of what we do, but on the other hand, you know, I have to say the beauty of the space that I'm working in now as a kind of curator in exile um, is that I'm less interested in existing models and I'm much more interested in this space of trying to create a model. I don't know what this is, but I am in the space of trying to create it right now. Yes? You know what, you know, I have a hundred stories. So will the role of the museum change as Harlem gentrifies? Okay, so um, when I was deputy director, what was my title, Lisa? Deputy director for exhibitions. exhibitions and programs. All right, when I was deputy director for exhibitions and programs at the Studio Museum, one of the things that fell under my purview was the store, right? I was in charge of the store. And um, I one day made some mandate from above that we were no longer going to sell um, Kwanzaa items, right? The Studio Museum in Harlem. Okay, I, I, I don't want to go too fast. Does everyone know what Kwanzaa is? Kwanzaa? Okay. So I said, we're not selling Kwanzaa items anymore, right? We're just, we're not going to do it. And I said this like in August because, you know, interestingly, the Kwanzaa stuff was coming in soon. So I said, no more Kwanzaa. Let's just, you know, I mean, we don't sell Christmas things. We don't sell Hanukkah things. I said, we're not going to sell Kwanzaa. So I felt very good about this decision. You know, I exist in a space of kind of, you know, racial fluidity. I'm a, you know, 21st century black person. I was not, you know, the Kuji Chakalia. I said, no, okay. So, <laughs> and you know, my, I was deputy director for exhibition programs. So no one, you know, pushed back at this. They all said, okay. So it happens that one day, probably to the great pleasure of my store manager, that I happen to walk into the store, because this is what I spend my time doing during the day. I go up to the studios, I go in the gallery, I go in the store, I talk to my man out on the street. And so I go into the store, and there is a man there, and he is, just as I walk in, I probably was staged, now that I'm telling you this story, I bet this was staged. He walks in, and he says to my store manager, hi, when are you getting in the Canara candles? Canara candles, so Canara is the menorah, it's like the Kwanzaa menorah. Um, and my store manager says, we don't carry them anymore, right? And I'm standing there, so I'm waiting to see how this is going to go down, because I know, I think, oh my gosh. And he says, really? He says, because last year, we bought our Kwanzaa candles here at the Studio Museum, and we were coming back. So, of course, I had to jump into it, and I introduced myself as Deputy Director for Exhibitions and Programs, and I introduced myself, and this man then told me that he and his partner and their three children, their three multiracial children, celebrate all holidays, right? Because he was white, his partner was African American, their children multiracial, and they celebrate all holidays, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa. They lived in Harlem. They were thrilled to buy these various things you know, things from us. They like being able to show their children all these different cultural, and I then caved right then. I just said, okay, right? I said, okay, we will do Kwanzaa. He invited me to his Kwanzaa. I mean, you know, it, it right? Um, now we have a full-on Kwanzaa celebration. I've fully embraced it. So how do we change? Well, we change by, on the one hand, um, not changing, right? So some of the change is by not changing. Um, but then we also change by really being sort of radical in our, in our idea of the values that we present to this changing community, right? And that was the thing I had to learn, right? So to this changing community, they wanted to attach themselves to things that existed in the community that were important to the community that defined the community. And so with that in mind, 
we continue to be who we are. Now, some of it is what has made me, as I say, as I'm a curator of contemporary art. Before uh, coming to the Studio Museum, I hadn't really even done very many exhibitions of artists who weren't alive. But this obsession, for example, with historic photographs is because literally, again, I have my you know 87-year-old father who still calls Lenox Avenue Lenox Avenue, even though it's Malcolm X Boulevard, and I have to say that to him all the time. But I, some of the work we do is to give people the opportunity to remember and to see this place that some of them, it is new for them. On the other hand, though, we do change so that we can embrace all aspects of this changing community. One of the things that I think that, one of the most interesting roles that I think we've had in this gentrification in Harlem is that we exist as a, we're not a neutral space because we're actually, it's not neutral, it's actually activated in some ways, but a space in which all of these things collide, but in ways that don't have um, the anxiety attached to them um, that they do in other parts um, of the community. So we try to stay the same and move at the same time. Question, yes. You know what? I don't know if I can answer that because I'm living it. You know, I'm living it. And I think that it is, it's a complicated thing. You know, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated that, um, you know, on the one hand, all of the effects of gentrification are real. Prices rise, people are crowded out, um, things change. On the other hand, some things haven't changed. We still live in a community with you know, educational deficits that are real and profound. So I guess I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. What I can say is that I work to make the Harlem that we live in, those of us who live in it, be a place that is good for everyone who lives in it. That's, that's what my work. Um, is about. I think change is inevitable, but I also feel committed to, you know, the space in which some ask, some things can remain and, and are rooted and stay the same. I mean, this is why I love my guy out on the street, you know, my vendor. I mean, you know, that's just like 1974 if I've ever seen it, right? I mean, you know. It's just, it does not matter how fancy we're getting. I mean, he literally is out there every day and he's got his products and he sells them. And, you know, in the summer he sells water. I don't know what he had like today. I mean, you know, every day there's something different that exists right across the street from H&M and all the big national chains that, you know, have come uptown. It's all, it's all happening together. But here's the thing about it. It's really, really rich and it's really, an interesting space to be a cultural institution in. Great. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Donna. Fabulous. Wonderful. And thank you all for coming to this extraordinary event. It was a pleasure to have.